Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous Podcast again. I'm really excited to have Neil Conlon here on. He is a powerhouse. He's an unapologetic optimist, and he sees the greatness in all people. And I really love that, knowing him. And he's an entrepreneur, he's a father, and he's a Marine Corps veteran. And he's a leadership coach. You do a lot, my friend. And not only that, I think I'm going to add, you're like this sportsman. You do like these ultra marathons or not marathons. What is it called? Uh, Ironman. Ironman. Oh, my gosh. It's so amazing. How do you do all of it? And welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to do this with you. It's such a great opportunity to, to uh, have gotten to know you a little bit and to uh, to share some space with you and to watch. I mean, I have your book right up here on my bookshelf. Um, and I'm excited to do this with you. Um, you know, what's interesting about like, how do I do it all is, uh, I, I get asked that question a lot because I have the same 24 hours in my day that you do. Um, and everybody else does. And, uh, people say, how do you do all the things that you do? And it really stems from the fact of, um, when I was growing up, my, I had four grandparents, three out of the four were immigrants and they just had this like can do anything they apply themselves to kind of mentality that I didn't even understand at all when I was that age. Um, and they really just kind of anchored this kind of mentality in me that I can do anything that I apply myself to. Um, they never said I had to play by the rules. They never said I had to do it like anybody else, everyone else was doing it. They never even told me how to get good grades in school. Um, they just said, you know, they just kind of instilled this kind of concept in me. And um, and then I remember being a teenager at an early age and someone referred to me as a journeyman. And I think that's what my entire life's work has become, where I don't have a lot of attachment to the things that a lot of people, other people do. I'm not attached to my profession. I'm not attached to my, the state I live in. I'm not attached to my cultural background. None of those things serve me well. And so they don't take up space in my mind at all. And so what I am attached to is progress. What I am attached to is providing for people. What I am attached to is protecting people physically, digitally, um, and I, what I am attached to is pioneering and seeing everything that's out there that the world can show me. And so that attachment is just constantly pulling me forward. Hence why I've built this brand over the past several years called press forward. So what is, um, I would first, I'd love to ask where, what's your background, your four grandparents, where are you from? Like an F I know you're American, but like, where, where's your heritage? Yeah. So three out of four of my grandparents are, um, were born Ireland, two of them in Southern Ireland, one in Northern Ireland. And then my, my grandfather who passed away this year, um, as Italian stereotypical, you build a sitcom out of this man of being a Brooklyn, a Brooklyn Italian. Do you feel like you've got more of the Italian in you? I, you know, it's funny because um, you look more Italian. I mean, you might be Irish, but you kind of remind me of an Italian guy. <laughs> well, the, the, the real funny thing about that is there's a picture buried somewhere of me and, and a half of my um, my Irish family on my father's side. And um, every every most of the men in that family are all five foot eight. and They look as Irish as Irish can be. <laughs> and there's this big broad shouldered tan guy in the picture. And it's just like, it, it looks like the waiter jumped into the family portrait. That's the way it looks. And um, what's interesting about that though, is, um, you know, a couple of years ago I did a 23 and me and I have basically like 0.2% of my 23 and me came back as basically having ties to um, there's a term that they use. I forget what it is, but basically that 0.2% is, is Norse Scandinavian heritage. <laughs> 
And I feel like whatever strain of DNA that that is, it just shot through the rest of the family tree and just landed right into me, which makes me, I, I just want to cold plunge all the time. I want to be in a sauna. I want to run marathons. I want to travel. Like, like I have this like w- warrior innate. Well, you look like a Viking. <laughs> And I kind of pull pull it off well. So you do, you do. And so in all your life experience, because you've been all over the map in a very exciting way from uh, venture capitalists to AI and branding and coaching and, and um, what this podcast is about becoming famous. And what do you think stops people? Because you're really, you're really at the forefront of opening the floodgates of someone's talent. Yeah, I, I think I think the biggest thing, what's really interesting about you know creating that, is um, more than anything, I think what people don't realize is you need two things. You really only need two things. The first one is permission. Mm. Like what's crazy about it is like, like we always, for the most part, want to emulate someone else. There is something inside the way that we learn or adopt principles that when we see somebody who's famous or an influencer, there really are like somebody, I want to be the Tony Robbins of the auto industry. Um, I want to be the Oprah of this industry, right? Because somebody's already done a lot of the the hard work to carve out what you want to be like, right? I, and, and if you look at historically going back, you know, through famous people, historians, philosophers, authors, right? There was always that one person who struggled to make that one person be the thing. And then everyone else just wanted the permission to be like that person. I can be like that person. Um, the second one is witness. I think what's wild about it is the reason, the, it's a weird word, but really something that I work with a lot of people on is, is that I think everybody on this planet is kind of entitled to recognize that um, you're great. You're a great human and you are an expert. You are amazing at something, even if it's just sucking wind. Like, and, and I think people all do what they do because they want someone to be wit to witness them kind of for who they are. Mm. And, and some people, um, when you have that realization that you get permission and you get witnessed, there's a little magic spark in there that where you get to choose what you want someone to witness you being. Like a big piece of the work that I do is that I think is really funny is a lot of people love the fact that I'm so consistent, so motivated and so disciplined. And it's not like I've got pockets full of motivation and consistency and discipline. Like you and I are equally as consistent. Every person around us is equally consistent. But at the end of that, there is something that they can you consistently choose to be consistent at. If you shower every day and brush your teeth every day and go to bed at the same time every day and eat healthy every day, you are consistently choosing that. If you don't shower every day and don't brush your teeth every day and and eat McDonald's every day and stay up till two o'clock in the morning, you are consistently choosing that every single day. Same level of consistency. It's just a matter of what you choose to do with that. And the biggest thing I think people is for them to choose that they want to have some kind of influence or famousness in their lives. I love when you talk about those two ideas, the permission, I think the permission and being seen. And I think when you go wanting to go into a metamorphosis, it's so important to find people that actually sees you at the other end, because Mm -hmm. when you're going through the journey and, and you help me out with that, right? You're helping me. Like I've had like fears with my book, I've not even, I've done everything wrong with promoting my book as opposed to everyone else's, right? And there was this magic moment when you were helping me was being seen as the new person. And I think that helped the people that work with me to see me as the new person and venture with me into that. Because I think what happens a lot of times, they're not doing it on purpose, 
But what they're doing is they see you as the old person and they're not seeing you as a new person. And when you have a metamorphosis, having someone from the outside say, oh, you are this now, then other people can come around you that used to see you differently. And I think the witness is something we don't take enough seriously in our change. And even when we are changing, to be mindful, like I'm going to be more mindful of that with my clients, like one of the goals that I do is I do bear witness to them, but making sure that other people bear witness and you have a group of people see it because then you can really step into and embody it and have more of the courage to do it, I think. Well, I mean, I mean, I've done so like so much work around this because, um, you know, if it, what it used to be, right, is is it, this is also like an access to resources thing. It's a privilege that we live in a world where people get to actually choose who they want to be and then making those edits in their lives. Right. For the for the most part, you know, the average person. Well, there's there's a saying. I think it might be a um, an art of war kind of quote that says out of a hundred warriors, you know, there are 90 people who think they're warriors. There's nine who are working towards being warriors. And there's one person that's an actual warrior. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the, 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 the 90 people who think they're warriors, like that's the average population of people who just get up every day and they are, living the life and the story that they were kind of dealt. And then there's basically nine of those people out of that, out, you know, out of that hundred who are contemplating, thinking, do I want to really be a warrior? You know, do I have this inside of me? Um, do I need better weapons? How do I get better at this? And they're kind of like kicking it around in their head. And there's one person who is out there kind of climbing through it like 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 really deciding that that's that what they're going to do and the hard hardest part about that is that you know the re, regardless of what school system you went into um we're kind of wired our mindset is wired to have a pass or fail mentality and you know i've what happened for me was that um my parents had me at a very young age, and so I didn't have a traditional foundation in place. They didn't have the tools for it, and it left me kind of carrying a bag growing up to, to really have to develop very strong belief systems within myself. So much so that I actually got to a point at a very young age where I just did, did not care about the system. So like I remember being like, like really young. This is really like my superpower is at a very young age, I was not indoctrinated into the traditional systems that most of us struggle with when we become adults. And I give people permission not to believe in those systems. So like I remember being in sixth or maybe seventh grade in elementary school and my, I just didn't care about school at a very young age. I did not care about it for some reason. The, it was interesting to learn, but the system didn't work for me. And what ended up happening as a result of that was um, I remember getting, I don't know, like a 75 average in, in grade school. And my teachers would say, Neil, do you know how much better you would do if you applied yourself? It was like seventh grade. Like I was like 13. And I remember looking at a teacher and being like, you do realize the only goal I have is to get out of here, right? Like I didn't care. I, you couldn't, there was nothing you could do even at that young of an age that could have moved me through the thought is all I, my goal is just to get out of this thing. And so what ended up happening as a result of that, though, is that my belief system within myself, I realized I have to I'm constantly editing myself. I'm never passing or failing. I'm constantly editing and constantly improving myself because I'm measuring my own success very, very differently than someone else's kind of metric system. I love the word you're saying, editing yourself. Is that when so you came to the Marine Corps very young then? Is that yeah, I, I signed up for the Marine Corps on my 18th birthday. Wow. How, how was that? Oh, I literally, I, I, I was at a stage in my life where I was like, um, I was getting into some trouble. And, and, you know, I joined the Marine Corps and had planned on it 
being a lifestyle profession, loved it, loved the singularity of it, loved the mission and purpose of it. And then just got to a place where after my second enlistment didn't, um, didn't align with that kind of goal anymore and abruptly kind of exited the Marine Corps and then really had to struggle with what transition was like um, because military transition is extremely hard, extremely hard thing to go from being so purpose driven to only caring about your salary for your month as, as a, 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 a way of measuring success. Now, what's interesting about that, though, just to like prove this point to people about editing yourself and not playing by the rules was um, when I first my first corporate job. And I'll make this really quick. I was making, I don't know, 60, let's call it $65,000 in New York City. And over the course of eight years, I quit about six jobs. Maybe, maybe it was five, but those five jobs were Guggenheim Partners, the hedge fund, Cushman and Wakefield, the largest commercial real estate firm on the planet, um, NBC, Morgan Stanley, and Fortress Capital, the private equity fund. And I remember when I, so Morgan Stanley, I got laid off from and the, the 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 job market was not great at that point. And I remember sitting with a recruiter, the recruiter looked at my resume and the recruiter said, Neil, there's nothing we can help you with here because you're a job hopper. You keep on leaping from job to job. Nobody wants to hire you. And I laughed because in that uh, eight years, I had gone from when I got hired at Guggenheim Partners, I was making $65,000 a year. And when I got let go from Morgan Stanley about eight years later, I was making, I think with overtime, $175,000 a year. And I remember it like not computing in my head and being like, I like six, like 50 X my salary. Like if I had stayed at Guggenheim for that long, I wouldn't have done that. And I remember being like, this is not the system that I play in. And so it really started to anchor into a lot of the work that I do with people now to be like, there's, there is no pass or fail. There is no, any of those things. If you don't conform to that system, there's a mindset of constantly editing and evolving yourself, which is why the validation piece of it, the witness piece of it becomes so important because you could be version 2.0 of yourself, version 2.2, 2.3, 2.5, 3.2. And then you go see your family for the holidays and they remember you as version 2.0 and they will suck you right back into this older version of yourself. Oh, I would love for you to expand on that because I think this is the hardest part of transitioning. And I see that with some of my clients, they're just about to push the button And then people around them are reminding them of a different version of themselves. And then they contract and they, and then they move away. And how do you, how do you know yourself enough that you are going to contract and you're going to hide and you're going to want to be another, the older version of you. And how do you create the system, the buffer, the help so that you don't, and you actually catapult yourself to the version that you would like to be. Yeah, I, I love this question. It's such a good one to ask. Um, you know, I think that first step is this crazy word that we now call awareness, right? The big thing is like, you have to have the awareness. And there's this thing that kind of goes on where I think a lot of people, whether it's through self care, or meditation or something, this little voice inside of us just starts to go like, hey, you do realize you don't like this, right? This thing. And I don't care whether it's smoking, drinking, an unhealthy relationship, a job, um, a behavior, a mechanism, whatever it is, at some point, this little voice is like, this is not where we want to be. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it, and at some point it starts to drive you. And if you don't listen to it, I think that's a lot of times when people have existential crisis, you know, it's like they just, it, it didn't happen overnight. It just kind of built up inside of you. And at some point the balloon just kind of, pops and then you're kind of left to take on take on the 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 now 
health and stress risks that are involved in that. You know, and so the, the example I give all times is like, it is really this like version 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, like, if I had a different belief system, I mean, like, like really just to go through that job as an example, you know, like I have never been to, in a college class in my life because I've always been like, I can figure this out. And I've always kind of understood, like, even now, if you look at what's going on with artificial intelligence, like, I don't, if you think you need a college degree in three years to ask it, like, you don't even need to know like how to do math anymore because you could even ask ChatGBT to tell me how much taxes I would need to pay if I make two hundred thousand dollars and I wanted to write it off. What would be the best way to do it? And ChatGBT will get you seventy five percent of the way there. And so it really is this like evolution of like you know of one believing in yourself, but two putting in the systems and the tools in place to be like. Yesterday, I ate Skittles every day for lunch, you know, and tomorrow I'm not eating sugar at all during the day and having an awareness to be like, it's going to be uncomfortable because your body gets addicted to the sugar and then actively choosing to be like, we're not eating Skittles for lunch every day and we're going to replace it with something else and we might fumble the ball but we're going to have a little bit of grace for ourselves and realize we're going to get back up very quickly and start to implement that and then we're going to start to tell the world hence the witness thing i don't eat sugar anymore right and then people going you don't eat sugar anymore versus oh you don't eat sugar anymore that's awesome right so you don't go falling back into the old story and you know, I think there's a lot of ego to us where we have to realize at the end of the day, we're animals and we know a lot about how the mind works for us. And so it's very proven. Like I, I always say to people, this is a big piece of my work with people is before you have a math, pro before you have an emotional problem, you have a math problem. And so if we use that example of like, I want to give up sugar and I eat Skittles every day for lunch just to make it something fun and not make it so like something quick drastic like money or love or something like that um it takes about 21 days for your mind to change a habit it takes about 45 days for that habit to become an actual habit like you, and then it takes about 66 days for it to become like an anchored routine and so like if you want to give up sugar or give up skittles you just have to go Oh, I just ha don't have to eat sugar for 66 days and it'll become habit like that. But if you only make it 12 days and then you go out and you decide to have ice cream and then you're going to beat yourself up over the fact that you had ice cream, you shouldn't beat yourself up to it. The only thing you have to beat yourself up on is that you didn't go 66 days without sugar. Wow. That's really, really fascinating. And I think you're so right. We have to have a whole new educational system. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think the colleges are going to collapse? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for what's going on right now. What I think is really interesting about this is I use the example of the Kindle as a perfect example. Um, mm -hmm. I often talk to businesses and I say, if you're not able to reshuffle the deck right now in society, you're doing something wrong. And what that means is is that years ago, the world kind of moved because technology wasn't where it was. And it. I remember being a kid and I remember there'd be a magazine and the magazine at the end of the school year would say, here's the jobs that we're going to need in four years because we want you to go to college for these things because in four years we can predict we're going to need more doctors, more veterinarians, more lawyers, whatever that thing is. The Kindle example is this. The Kindle example is that when the Kindle came out, everybody for like a year said the book is dead. And what ended up happening is um, it didn't die at all. It went like a year where everybody, because we love new things and we love marketing, everybody bought a Kindle 
And then everybody realized that they loved to read the news on a Kindle and hated to read a fiction book on a Kindle. And so then everybody had a Kindle and everybody went back to books and any bookstore that made it through that bounced back and Amazon took advantage of it. And now clearly in my, I have books all over the place and I order probably 10 books a month. But this, the, the deck of cards just had to reshuffle. And so I think what's going to go on now is that that has now um, moved extremely fast. And I think that anybody who um, pushes back against things like AI or pushes back on, on things actually changing and is trying to hold on to you, – you're just creating a resistance to something that is so far out of your control – that you're just going to get left behind at this point. I I think this is the best thing I've heard about AI transition. It's a reshuffling. I it's never re- thought of it that way. I never thought of this. You're absolutely right. It's a re it's a reshuffling, but it doesn't mean things are going to get lost. It means right now and it's exactly what I was talking to um someone I had on a podcast earlier, uh, Mark Cloisterman, he was saying it's really um efficiency for the next year we're going to be taking away all of the tasks that were to make it more efficient, but we're still going to be the same in some yeah. ways. I, I, I think, and I think the hardest part about it is that a lot of, like if you, again, it's, it's going to take a huge mindset shift and, and I'm, and, I, and I'm here for it and I'm excited about it because if you look at this, right, if you look at when McDonald's is a perfect example because there's a really good use case for it. When McDonald's and other fast food chains first started, right, Mm -hmm. they kind of had a a pop culture kind of influence as, number one, it was a fast way to get food, faster, right? And then they built the whole entire infrastructure on, like, let's hire young people and give them jobs and teach them entry-level skills, and then we can pay them less than their parents, like that, like fundamentally, the whole business is built on like all Steve or Michelle does is flip a burger and then hands it to Steve and then Steve or Michelle puts a bun on it and then we can only pay them minimum wage It's a, and we'll teach them skills, right? In, two, when, in 2009, when the housing market burst and a whole bunch of people lost their jobs and they all went to fast food jobs, and then started to complain about the, the working conditions and the hourly rates, they broke that system. There's no reason for a 35 or 40 year old person to work at a McDonald's. It doesn't serve them well for any reason other than they had to get a paycheck to feed their families and I have a lot of empathy for the fact that somebody had to do that. But then McDonald's's bottom line went to all right, we'll hire 40-year-old people and we'll figure out how to automate the systems more and we'll remove the person away from it and we'll put kiosks in, which is what has happened over time. Again, the shuffling of the deck. So now in that new modality, though, that what people don't realize is they're driving these mechanisms is that there's no real job skill for somebody working at McDonald's anymore. And so now the skill has been taken away. You should be completely okay with automating the entire process of McDonald's. I don't want to even talk to a human now. If you can figure out how to automate that entire system and I can get my filet of fish sandwich the one time a year that I actually eat one of those things, then I don't need a human to do that. And the, the reality is, is that a human shouldn't want to do that job. That's the key mindset shift is that you're going to see lots of jobs get sucked out of the economy very, very quickly, but they're not jobs that humans want to do anyway. Like fundamentally, nobody wants to sit behind a grill for eight hours and flip burgers. No, but it means that we have to re-educate people because I think what's what's a challenge, at least for me as a Gen Xer and for possibly other people um, that's been brought up pre-internet or like right when the internet before the gen a is that we've been so taught to be in silos and in systems right and uh how do you how do you train people now to break free from that and i think that's what your press forward is really about 
Totally. It, 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 it is a, it is a huge, huge shift in thinking and, and to change into it, but it also creates a lot of like real opportunities. I mean, I, I think, I think the big thing is, is like one of the things that people want to work with me on is like, I believe fully in this term lifestyle by design. Like really like, and, and, and I, I'm such an extremist, I think in some of the aspects of it where it's like last year, I mean, I'm, I'm last year I was 45 years old and um, I only worked 20 hours a week um, last year because that's what I wanted to do last year. And I did a whole bunch of endurance races throughout the year and I traveled a bunch and, and I made, made great money last year just to prove the fact that I could do it for no other reason. And, and I think it really is, it, it is this uncomfortable feeling, which is why the permission and the witnessing is so important because if you try to do this by yourself, it doesn't work very well because you're just gonna get scared. And I think this is one of the things that people misunder, misunderestimate about why the lack of community in the world now is becoming so important because really what communities used to give to people was at, in its essence, there's two things that a community really gives you. One, it um, a community always pitches to you that you will not suffer if you're part of it. Number two, and I'll give you an example in a second. And number two, I don't think people realize how much validation and witnessing a community will give you. So if you look at um, every church, every college, every other form of a community that exists, their promise to you is that if you come here with us, you will not suffer. A college says, if you come here, we'll educate you and you'll get a great job, right? So at every foundational layer of every community, there is come here and you will not suffer. And then, you know, years and years ago, when the neighborhood that you lived in be was important, right? You moved into a neighborhood your, with your family of people who were kind of like you, um, and you bought the same cars, and you had the same lawn, and you had the same backyard. It was be it was a, a validation mechanism to be like, these are my people. Oh, I'm like these people. I can be accepted here. And now that we don't have those two things. Lots of times what people really suffer from is the thing that I suffered from for years is I realized the only time that I ever really got stuck or the only time I ever felt alone was when I didn't have good counsel and support, which again is just witness and validation. But I, I, I think it's such a powerful way of re phrasing and helping people with a paradigm shift is finding how do you find that right how do you uh i mean we were lucky zachary and i are really lucky that we're now part of your paradigm and your community right uh, but how do people find a community that fits and it feels like you're almost like a lot of a lot of uh, evangelical christians they're like shopping around for the church right it's like you're shopping around for a community and you're like looking at the list. Like I'm looking at the churches online. It feels like it's a sales pitch. Come to our church because this is what we're going to get you. And even the Catholic church is doing that. I'm Catholic and I'm like looking at these things and I'm like, wow, this seems like this parish is selling that. This parish is selling that. And it's you're almost like being able to buy. But does that lose the impact of the community? Well, I think what happens now is I think we have this reshuffling of the deck of what a community really is for us, mm -hmm. because the community used to be globally, it used to be tied to your religion, your race, and your cultural heritage, and probably the money that you made. Like, basically, that, that like, that's just the reality of it. Like, you lived in a neighborhood with people like you, who came from the places that you did, and made the type of money that you could afford to live in that place. And now I think it's like very, very different because we're race, creed, color, gender, preference. There's so much different option there. And there's also like, you know, there's a, there's a, I think the big upheaval that's going on right now is um, 
people's mindsets. And I think like one of the things I think I've, I, I work with people on is, is like, I'm very clear. Like I, I get this all the time. Like I will be like, if I will be very clear that my, what gets me excited is the opportunity to provide, protect and pioneer. Three words I can sum it up in. And, and someone goes, Neil, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> and I'm like, great. You're not my person. Like I will not, t- I will, I will not pick up the phone when you call. I love you, but we're different. And I think that's okay. And I think that's the shuffling that our communities are going towards where like, there's people who are like, <clears throat> why wouldn't you get more? You should go back to church or you should build you know, like, but if that church doesn't provide for me a community where I can provide, protect and pioneer, I'm out. But that's because I've gotten so clear on myself. And I think the big piece for people, the takeaway people should take from this is like, there is this kind of journey or pilgrimage that you have to go on by yourself to really figure out what it is that you really want. You know, I think that is, and that's when I was writing the book, Fame Revolution, what really came to me is that there's a burden to becoming famous and there's a burden to be in a culture where you have to become famous. Like I've had several podcast interviews right now, always talking about, you got to sell yourself. You got to be out there. You got to know who you are. And really the people that are going to be the winners of this new society are the people that are actually going inward and working on themselves and finding out who they are and taking that labor of going inside and taking all of the, trauma from your childhood, the traumas that have been in your life, they're the ones that are really going to be up leveling in some senses, because that's how you really get to know who you are. Well, and, 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 and I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's the, the two things that come up for me in that is that one, I don't think people realize that in all areas of history, his, history, um, that people don't realize that they are always in every relationship that they have, they are either a making a contract with somebody energetically Mm. and B there's always a tax. You're always, there's always a tax and, and, and you have to realize that like there's a transit, like as humans, our consciousness is actually very transactional. And, the, and I think that's okay. It's not about like, it, so you can get real clear if you're like, I'm always gonna make deposits into people so that if I ever needed to make a withdrawal, it's always available to me. But there's also that like, don't take advantage of the system, right? Which is what happens in business a lot of times, how, how businesses go sideways. And, and, the, and the second piece of that also is it really does become, this concept of like, um, like, like really being able to get real clear through a coach or some kind of mentor or third party over like what it is that you really want. Like, I like, 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 and I think that's so underestimated about getting a coach because we all have this story in our head of, of things. And I'll give you a really good example that a couple of years ago, and I, I, as even as a coach, I always have multiple, multiple coaches in my lives. And I, and, and, and why I think a coach is important is because there needs to be a transaction involved because your friend is always going to do what's best for you. They think they think is best for you. And they're always going to tell you the thing that they think you need to hear. And, and in that moment, and a lot of times that's not what you really need to hear in that moment. And so a couple of years ago, one of my coaches, um, I was talking to them uh, on a call and I was talking about um, that I wasn't happy living in New York any longer. And at the time I was living in New York full time. And, um, and my coach said to me, where would you wanna live? And I was like, well, here, here or here. And they were like, why would you still want to live there, there, there? And I was like, well, you know, I want to be near an airport for my, to get to access to my children. And, um, 
and this is where I can make really good money. And I, and my coach was like, that's not the question that I asked you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? And my coach was like, well, if Neil was going to choose where Neil really wanted to be, like, don't think about your kids for a second. Don't think about money for a second. Like, where would you really want to be? And I remember having this moment that I've had multiple times throughout my own kind of inquiry with myself of feeling good that I didn't have the answer. Hmm. And it's almost like, like, like a, a childlike feeling that you lose as an adult because we're expected as adults to have all the answers. Even if the answers are, I would never do that. Versus like when you're a kid, a teacher comes in and this is why I think people enjoy being teachers to like young children is like that science teacher comes in one day and says, Hey kids, today we're going to learn about the periodic table and nobody knows what the fuck that is. And so the kids all go, what is that? (laughs) And then you get to wow a child. And so when my coach really asked me that question and said, where would Neil really want to live? I think I like the next day I was going to the airport or something. I just sat in the car, like really just like, would it be Paris, India, Egypt, like the mountains, maybe near the ocean. I never lived near the, but my coach brought that feeling to me in a way that uh, no friend or family member or myself could bring to me. And I think that's really what a part of what a coach's job is in, in this type of work. Yeah. Uh, what would you say uh, are the criteria for someone? Like say right now we're seeing someone that says, wow, I really need to step up. Uh, I need to have some permission. I need to have some witness in my life and I need to find something outside of what I'm doing right now. What would be the criteria? Because there's a lot of coaches out there. I feel like there's a lot of sharks that you, sh- you really shouldn't trust or how do you, and it's like in this whole AI space as well, who can we trust today? And how do you recommend someone what kind of criteria do you think would be good for someone to find their tribe find their community and even when they don't quite know themselves but how can they take that first step i i go back to the the, the i agree with you that there's this gray area where i think I'll, i think a large majority of the coaching universe um has the best of intentions but how you get there is kind of a little bit gray. And so I think the first step is, is that a person here, like, I think a person has to have that first vulnerability and awareness to be like, that they don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then they have to really look at like, what's this mountain that I want to climb? And I think that lack of goal is really the biggest struggle because if someone says, I want to make a million dollars this year, most, and you've never done that before, most of the people that know you are going to be like, who the fuck are you to, to, to want that? Versus I think the concept of getting real clear on like, hey, here's my goal. Um, what's the system? and tools that I need in place to do that. Clearly, I don't have some of them. I need to get some support. And then there's kind of a grace and kindness to being like along that way while I'm learning something new, I'm going to fall and stumble. And you may actually, I think the biggest thing that I've realized over my own journey is that you may accomplish the goal and realize that's not the thing that I wanted anyway. But now I have new tools and systems in place for that. And I think it's like, like, like I did so much work early on in my career and still do it that um, I really was bad at uh, romantic and relationships, right? I was, I've been divorced twice, countless other relationships in my life. Um, and I, and I laughed when I got coaching on it a couple of years ago and my coach was like, do you even know what a healthy relationship is? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And they were like, all right, tell me what a healthy relationship is. 
And I was like, I blurted out some craziness. And then my coach was like, Neil, go ahead, share your screen and let's Google what a healthy relationship looks like. And they pull up this thing and there's like these 10 things on like, you always operate in a high level of, of this. You always have this. You always show up this way. You And my coach was like, do you think you could even do those 10 things consistently? And I was like, like four of them. And I was like, oh, I don't even, the thing that I've been telling myself in the head for a long time that I want, I don't even know what that really means. And I don't even know the way to get there. And I'm wondering why I can't find it. And so you can do like, you want to be in a healthy relationship? You need to define the goal of what a healthy relationship is. You want to make, if you want to make a million dollars in your business, um, that's a very different map or blueprint than if you wanted to make 200,000 or 5 million. Those are very different blue blueprints, right? You want to have a certain type of body. You want to weigh 190 pounds as a guy. You want to weigh 160. You want to weigh 225. Those are different sleeping routines, different workout routines, different nutrient routines. Like this can be applied in every aspect of your life that unless you really understand clearly what it is that you want to get to, you can't build the blueprint for it, the map. Then your compass or your brand or pillars or your, your core values may not be the right core values to get you to this goal. And it's, it's this whole concept of before you have an emotional problem, you have a math problem because once the math problem is clear, it is very easy to build a system and tool around it and then, and then really accomplish the thing that you do really, really well. And that's really what I kind of embrace in my life. And that's really what I teach people on how to do. Before you have a, it's a math problem. That's really powerful. Wow. Well, it, 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 it's a wild thing. I recent, I'll give you one quick example. I recently was coaching one of my, one of my friends and clients and we were kind of realigning on goals. And my client said, um, I said, how much do you want to make this year? And they were like, oh, I want to make like $250,000 this year. And they're a coach because I like coaching coaches because this is funny to do with coaches too. More fun to do with coaches. And I said, all right. How many hours are you working a week right now? Well, I'm working about uh, about um, 20 hours a week. And I said, all in, all in. You're 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 make you're working 20 22 hours a week. And they said, yep. They're doing administration. They're doing sales. They're doing everything. That's all they work is 20. I said, well, then your average customer. Uh, you know, like how many customers are you bringing on a month? About one or two. And I said, well, there's this many months left in the year. Are you charging your client $12,000? Because 12 times 22 means like you'd have to be bringing on two maybe three clients a month and they need to be charged. You'd be charging them $12,000. Like the math doesn't make sense. Like the thing that you think you want is impossible based on the math that's involved, but you're going to get into it and you're going to beat yourself up and you're going to blame your brand. You're going to blame your website. You're going to blame your system. You're going to blame yourself. You're going to blame the clients. You're going to blame all these things and before you even got anywhere near that, the math problem clearly says that this is improbable and impossible. But yet you know, that's where yeah. it does. You know, you, it's very interesting you do that because the most successful project I've done is when I put it into an Excel sheet first. Like when I do events, I put them into an Excel sheet and I anticipate. And I usually uh, course correct maybe one or twice, sometimes up, sometimes down. But having that as the mile marker, you're absolutely right. I never thought of doing that in your personal life. But having the awareness of the math problem is very powerful. It, it's the funniest thing because sometimes when I coach people, I love it sometimes because some of my clients who are single, who are trying to get back into dating, will ask me to write their uh, 
Bumble or Tinder profile for them. And it's so much fun to do for somebody else. Um, <laughs> because I get to vicariously live through them because I'm in a very ha happy and healthy relationship. Um, and it's still a math problem. It's like, I, I actually, I'll, I'll give you one more quick example. I had a, fr a friend of mine reach out for some coaching a couple of years ago. And they said this woman was beautiful, beautiful woman. She made really, really great money. She was super successful. And she was like, Neil, I'm miserable. I can't. Nobody likes me. Nobody likes me. And I'm on all the dating apps and I'm going out to bars and I go to mixers and nobody likes me. I'm tired of this. So I'm, that, I'm so sorry that, that you have to go through this, but I think you have a math problem. And she was like, Neil, F off. I don't have a math problem. I'm just getting old. Like I'm all becoming an old hag. And I said, you have a math problem. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, all right, do you know the type of man that you would like to date? And she's like, I clearly know. And I was like, all right, tell me all the details. Give me the bullet points. And she said, he looks like this. He makes this much money. He's this age. Kids are like this. Education's like this. This is like this. This is like this. And I said, I love this. How many of those men do you think live within 50 miles of you? And she was like, I never thought about it like that. And I, I, I said, look it up. I said, look it up. She, I was like, she's tall. She wanted a man over six foot. She wanted a man who was over 40. And she wanted a man who made, I think it was over $250,000 a year. And I said, look up the public record. Look up what the numbers are for that in the United States. And she was like, this can't be right. And I said, no, no, tell me. I already know the answer, but tell me, I want to hear it. I want to be right. And she's like, that is 1% of the country. And I said, yeah. And they're not where you, within 50 miles of where you live. Like where she lived was very rural and stuff like that. I was like, so if that's the universe of people that you really want, you may need to pick up and move. Like if that's really what you want, rather than beating yourself up, sitting at the bar by yourself, having a drink by yourself, settling for somebody who doesn't fit that criteria because of your own ego being very, very shallow. And then getting into a relationship where you beat yourself up again over the, like that, that cycle. If that's really what you want, you should pick up a move. And that's what she did. And she moved and she's in a relationship. And every time I bring it up to her that I helped her get there, she tells me how much she I'm a jerk and I love it. <laughs> that, wow, that, that, wow. We're coming to a close, but that, that's really profound. You're absolutely right. Sometimes we, and it reminds me of when I was going for a job and I got the job. It was like, I got to be press secretary in Congress and I absolutely hated the job. And it was really someone like you coming to me and asking me, what are my criteria? And I was looking at the criteria this job totally mismatches with my whole personality. And that's kind of what you have to do with everything in your life, personally, professionally, everywhere. That's well, and, and, and that's, you know, the final thing I'll say is, is like, I get it that in the world of coaching, it sounds super weird to have someone coach you on your life, right? It sounds- No, yeah, it sounds, does. And, and, you know, like I, I like to say, I'm more of a business and life strategist more than anything else. But if you look at the good examples of where there are coaches, right, like like uh, you look at college football, you look at gymnastics, you look at, you know, any of these places that have coaches who become kind of well-known coaches. Um, there's a f there's a specific goal that they are going to give you a playbook that they will help you get to. Like, like one of, one of my coaching clients, um, is a woman named Valerie Kandos. Um, and she, Valerie is coach Val. I love coaching coaches. It's the best. Um, coach Val has produced more Olympic athletes than any other coach in the world. 
she produces champions and she she has never done gymnastics herself and yet she produces has produced the most olympians of any coach ever at any major college in the world. And it is because that she creates champions. That is what she does. And she has a process and a system and tools in order for people who come with raw talent um, to be molded into being powerhouses. I mean, she's coached from Simone Biles all the way down to a dozen other and these are the type of people that I get to coach on how they can improve their coaching because of this, this mindset approach of witness and mindset and having a math problem before you have an emotional problem and building tools around that. Wow. I think you're right. We all need a coach. I always say editors, but coach is probably a better word. I've just had a hard time saying coach because um, but you're right. It's a mind shift that I think we all need in this changing times to have a coach. And I have several people that, that I go to, but you were kind of reminding me that you need to have peers. You need to really be more intentional about who you have in your life to coach you. And I've really appreciated that. So coming to close, uh, what I'd like to know is what would you like to be known for in your personal life and in your professional life? And they can be mm. the same, thing, but a lot of times people see themselves kind of separately and they give different visions for both. I kind I kind of laugh at this. I really like it um, because there's two versions of me in this. There's this momentum version, right? Which is why some of my coaching programs reference this momentum. Like I am very clear on the need for progress and to move forward. Um, that would be the first kind of energetic feeling I want to is like, I have this let's go attitude. Um, on the other side of that, I'm kind of like an oak tree. Mm -hmm. Like I'm strong and firm in my belief system. And, um, and it's funny because we live in this world of banter. We live in this world where people want to go back and forth and I'm just not there. I operate from this place of like, we can have a difference of opinion and I don't want, don't need you to try and change mine. And so those are the two places where personally and professionally, it's like when the opportunity present, prevents, presents itself for us to move forward, I am so in for that conversation. Uh, other than that, I want to be known as this oak tree that uh, kind of has this indomitable kind of value system. Oh, I love that. What a great contrast. The yin and the yang of your life. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Neil, I want to just say this was a delightful, thought-provoking conversation. I really appreciate it. And uh, in the show notes, we'll have everywhere you can be found. And I would recommend you read his book. He's got a book called Press Forward. And he has another book. I keep forgetting the title of it. It's the new book with your uh, military. Um, yeah. So, so we have the Press Forward book, which is uh, a pocket, pocket guide for leaders. And then I have my other book that I co-authored with 49 other people and Scott Manthorne, which is called The Military Effect. No. Um, both of them are available on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the places. All the places. Well, got to get pressing forward and we just have to learn more about it. But I want to say thank you so much for today. Yeah, thank you for doing this. I love sharing time with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.